we're officially live. I mean, you guys' phones need to be put away, please, briefly. Uh, I'm going to walk you through some things that we need to set up about Adobe Illustrator. We did the updates to the seating chart. They are, uh, you can find them. Oh, I thought I replied. Uh, I will reply to it here. Um, but you'll notice we're actually going to start our first project. Those examples that I gave you the other day, I'm going to show you how to do a little bit of uh, Illustrator setup as well as one of the main differences between Illustrator and Photoshop. You can see that vectors versus that rasters in action. Um, and then I'm going to show you how to do the art brush portion and then the vectorized portion of the line project if we have time. And then I want you guys to do this third one on your own. And this will all make sense here in, uh, in just a second. But let us open up. You're good. Let us open up Adobe Illustrator by you have two options. You can either open it through the Creative Cloud or you can click on your Windows button on your PC. And then it's this orange A, capital A, lowercase i file right here that's going to pop up. Um, it's going to create something called a splash screen, which you can't see on the Zoom room, but you can see on your uh, page. Hi, good morning. Um, we're in the Zoom room talking about Adobe Illustrator. So this, you guys may be greeted with a sign-in window. This is where you sign in with the same login that you use for your OneDrive. It's important that you use your Issaquah account and not any of your personal accounts because the school provides us with the Creative Cloud Suites. So, um, seating chart update. Yeah, I think you're you're Jack, right? Yeah. Yeah, you're on that corner next to Yasin. Okay. So, once you guys finish logging into Illustrator, your screen is going to look like this. Make sure you use your Issaquah login. Um, this is where you can use this Creative Cloud on multiple different computers. So if you install this on your home PC, as long as you download Creative Cloud and sign in with your Isaqua account, you can download whatever app you want to experiment with. We've got Premiere Pro, After Effects. We have uh, Animate, use InDesign, Photoshop, Lightroom. We got them all. Thank you, Isaqua. Yeah. Make sure you go there. Yeah. Um, wait, what I got? So you go to the computer um, by making sure your web is beyond that. You should that once you finish that process, you just type to make sure you have a and click on the whole Alright. So with you guys, you gotta move see something. You gotta prove to me that it's gonna work. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Put a lot of trust. All right. So who's still logging in? Can I see some hands of who's still logging into? Illustrator, I think we're most okay. No worries. No worries. This meeting is also recorded, so you can, uh, or this lecture is also recorded, so you can always go back and uh, go from there. I will help you catch up here in just a second, but I want to walk you uh, through those of you who have got logged in and yours uh, is all updated. This is the start screen to any Illustrator file. Illustrator files are strictly in that vector space, they're all going to be. Um, Pretty lightweight. They're not going to take up much space because we're not actually creating pixel recipes so much as we're creating uh, what are called paths, which is uh, which is what I'm going to show you here in just a second. As a tour, you have some little default options that you could start with here uh, for document sizes. We're setting up a document similarly to how you would set up like a Word doc. Um, but for the purposes of this assignment, I want you to click on this new file button, which is going to greet you with another sort of pop-up. Here's just more presets. Here's more of like the recent sizes that I've used. So once you've made a couple different types of Illustrator files, you're going to have more in here. I just want us to focus on this right-hand column, the small one that says Untitled 1, and it's got some extra stuff that I want to walk you through here. We're going to leave this Untitled 1 blank for now. You'll have a chance to apply that Canvas naming scheme that's required for, um, for submission. But the things that I want you guys to change, because mine's already been set up, yours is going to look a little different. This is where you configure the size of what's called an art board. An art board in Adobe Illustrator is kind of like your canvas. It's not your like canvas.com, but like the painting canvas that you use, uh, because it's where the art is going to happen, and it's going to be kind of the frame that contains everything that you're working with. And this window is where you size that frame which is what I want you guys to set it to five by five inches. Yours probably says points, however, though. And it says points, picas, or pixels to stick with the P categories of words. To change that, you click on this drop down right here where it says points, pixels, picas. Uh, you want that to be in inches. When you click on it, you can see there's, uh, in theory, 
there we go. It's got a lot of different sizing options. We just want inches for the purposes of this assignment. It's gonna set our document dimensions so that it makes a little bit more sense when we go to print. You want this to be accurate to the size that you're working with. Since we're sticking to digital, this is easy to resize. But if we were um, gonna make some posters or some zines, it's really important that they are the correct actual size so that they turn out the way that you intend them to. You got a width and height section. This is where you set the width and height of your canvas or your artboard, so to speak. I want you guys to set that number both to five. You'll have a five inch square um, piece. Before you hit create though, you need to check and make sure that this drop down, this is the last drop down you need to focus on while you set up your file. Make sure that this says RGB color not CMYK color, you want RGB. RGB is the digital color space. It's the one that where you're looking at monitors or screens. CMYK is for printing and physical. We're not doing this project print nor physical, so we're gonna stick to RGB. And you can leave everything else as is. And then you click create, and you're gonna be presented with a screen that probably looks a little bit different from mine. Yours probably looks a little bit something like this. It's got a column of single tools on the left-hand side here. It's got a couple of little words towards the top bar and then a bunch of uh, stuff just inside of this column space on, if you're looking at your screen, it's on the right-hand side. This is great. This is the essentials workspace. This is what Adobe has decided is the bare minimum that you need to do what Illustrator is used for, creating those vector graphics, those easy to scale web designs, stuff like that. This does not have all the tools that we actually use or that I used in my experience as a graphic designer. This doesn't have everything we need at an easily accessible glance. So to change that, this is something that I'm requiring each of you to do. You go to Window and then Workspace, and you wanna check the box underneath Essentials that says Essentials Classic. When you click on Essentials Classic, there's gonna be a bunch more tools that pop up. Those are the tools that you are gonna be uh, really accurately using in a lot of this graphic design process. Um, so as long as yours looks like mine does, it's gonna be a little bit different on the Zoom room because I have a smaller monitor, but you should have two columns of tools. You should have a uh, another set of tools that have appeared on the top underneath the words. And then there's some more buttons on this right-hand side next to this contextual um, column of a bunch of stuff that doesn't make sense yet. But as long as yours is in Window, Workspace, Essentials Classic, that's how you know you're in the right spot. So you go up to Window, this is the word you push on the top, and then Workspace. It's both point. Essentials Classic. Cool, looks good. Very nice. Okay, so this workspace, this is our artboard. This is in essence, if we were to go to print this picture, it would be five inches by five inches, and it's all the design that's contained inside of the white space here. If you look at your keyboard, you'll find ALT, which stands for Alt. Well, okay, it says Alt, but it means alternative, obviously. If you hold on that Alt key and scroll with your mouse, you're gonna zoom in and out on your artboard, okay? Getting around your artboard, especially as it grows in complexity and as it grows in different pieces of design, you can put different pieces of uh, inspiration or reference around this outside. Getting around the document is one of the quickest ways to become a more efficient and a more effective graphic designer. It's just kind of like learning to ride the bike, right? We're working in the training wheels phase. We're getting the, uh, the basics down before we start getting into the uh, the bombing master hills, right? I think that was skateboarding anyway. So the other tool that I use all the time to navigate around is the space bar. If you hold the space bar, your cursor is gonna turn into a little hand. And whenever you click and drag, it's like you're moving around, you're grabbing and you're moving the uh, artboard or the space around on your screen. This is really important because you wanna think of this illustrator space, if I zoom way out, that's our five by five inch square. And we have all of this considering like a table or like a desktop that we can work with here. We can put inspirational materials. We can put, um, I'll open up one of my other files so you can see how I use this extra space. But the gist is this white space that we've created here, this artboard, this is the frame that when you export or when you save your project for its final version, only what's on the artboard is going to be exported. Kind of like a picture frame. A lot of this is to do with how you organize your visuals, how you organize your projects. 
Whatever's contained in the white space is going to be included. Whatever's kind of in your desk space or your workspace out here is going to be excluded or removed from the uh, from the submission. So to actually see a difference between vectors and rasters, because I keep saying those words, but you don't really have a point of reference for them, I'm going to open up Photoshop real quick and show you the big difference. So I'm just going to create a new random Photoshop file. You don't have to do this. Um, but here we have Photoshop. It looks very similar to Illustrator because they're all the same product. But if I make a box in Photoshop and I fill that in with just some black color like this, and then if we go to Illustrator and I use the shape tool, I'll show you how to do all these uh, here in just a second. I use the shape tool to create a black rectangle. Both of these on your screen or on the projector look pretty much exactly the same, right? There's a very key difference between how these programs handle visuals that I want you to see here. When I zoom in on Photoshop, the raster based editor, if I zoom way in on the black square here, you're going to see that it's going to turn into, once I get close enough, a big grid of black, smaller black squares. This is the pixel recipe that I am telling Photoshop to do in order to make this black square appear as a black square. That's rasters. That's the grid, German for grid right through there. Each one of these pixels corresponds to a pixel on my screen. And the computer tells it to turn from this color to whatever the, the recipe is for pure black, like this, right? Illustrator, on the other hand, you can think of uh, rasters as kind of literal. Like, this is a plotted graph of all of the parts where they need to become uh, black as compared to white, also known as a bit map, because you're mapping the bits to a specific color. Illustrator, on the other hand, if I zoom in on the black square, no pixels show up. Okay. It's because there's not actually creating a recipe for where pixels uh, specifically belong on the screen. But if I click on this, you'll notice some information happens around the outside edge. There's a square in each corner. There's a square in the middle. And there's a square halfway through each of those corner relationships. This is how my computer is interpreting this shape. It is only the relationship between these squares, which are called anchor points. You can notice those by with the little crosshair on the uh, on the Zoom room. These anchor points are all references, kind of like a quest, that my computer is taking in order to interpret the information that I want it to. And a lot of that is kind of abstract thinking. A lot of it doesn't make the most sense. But the gist that you need to keep in mind is that this square is not technically filled in with black, whereas this square is literally filled in with the instructions for black. This, because it's not literal, I can resize to any size I want with no loss of quality. It retains its original, um, its original like crispness, its original HD amount. Doesn't matter how small or how large I make this square because that's a vector. It's not actually changing the recipe for the pixels. It's just changing the relationship between the anchor points. If I were to go into here, which I can't even edit because it's not a mathematical relationship. It's a literal uh, like paint on a photograph. I can't resize this in a way that makes a lot of sense. Even if I did make it really, really small, see how small I can make it. And I zoom all the way in here. You're going to notice that the quality starts to suffer a little bit because you can really start to see those pixels start to become pixels. If I keep resizing it, it's going to run out of room. We're down to two pixels now. It's not going to resize very well because it's a raster image. It's an actual recipe for the bits as compared to how do the anchor points interact with one another. And you can really see this in Illustrator. If you take your brush tool, which is B on your keyboard, watch what happens. When it's press B, it turns into this little <coughs> paintbrush with an asterisk on it, right? So I'm going to click and drag, and it's going to make uh, its default color is black to start off. But see how kind of the edges are a little bit jagged as I go around uh, and like if I go really small movements, they get kind of jagged. When I let go of my mouse, you're going to notice that these are going to become a tiny bit smoother. It's going to look a little bit more like a spaghetti noodle as compared to a um, paint on a paper. It's because I've created what's called a path. A path is a relationship between two anchor points. Right now, my first anchor point is at the end of this. I can move this around however I need to. 
My first anchor point is wherever I started clicking. If I hover over the end, if you follow, if you copied what I did, wherever you started clicking is going to be your starting anchor point. And wherever you finished clicking is going to be your ending anchor point. When I hold space bar, um, you'll notice oh, I have to have it selected. You know, you have something selected in the Adobe products when you have this square around the outside. The name of that square is called a bounding box. But you'll notice if I zoom in and I hold space bar, you see there's lots of little squares connected by a straight line along this brush path that I created inside of or using the brush tool. So with it selected and hold space, you can see the anchor points that are happening there. This is another uh, key benefit to vectors is because these are just anchor points and they're not literal maps to pixels, I can take something like the direct select tool, which is this white filled in or this more opaque uh, triangle in the top left corner here. I can grab any of these anchor points in theory. Let me grab it and I can move it around and adjust these uh, this path however I need to without incurring any loss of quality. And the biggest thing is that paths are a lot more adjustable than rasters are. That's why rasters is typically used for things like photography or things that like print that aren't going to need to scale depending on whether you're using the, uh, the website on a movie theater screen or an Apple Watch. There's a super wide range of possibilities there. And by making it so as a mathematical relationship, as compared to a physical map of a destination, Vectors have the ability to scale up and down super easily without any loss of quality. So let me give you an example. I'm going to pull up my, um, let me get rid of all these real quick. I'm going to open up one of my previous Adobe Illustrator projects real quick. Uh, this is this year. I actually need last year. Hold on. Let me find it real quick. I think it was this one. Did I save the AI file? No, I did. Oh, I did. Okay, cool. All right. So let me open this up real quick. This is how I designed my uh, canvas like decoration last year. This was a draft of it. This is not the permanent uh, the permanent result. But you can see I have some inspiration on the uh, edge of my workspace here. I have a color palette that I'm working with. I have some font options. I have some patterns that I'm creating. This space is a very easy workspace to use. Hi, welcome back. A very easy workspace to create and gather all of your materials into one spot so that you can uh, easily design a um, an export or a product, not a product, so to speak, but like a deliverable that makes uh, the, cl the cleanest sense and it keeps all of your inspiration in one spot. Okay, so is this all making sense so far? Okay. Sticking with the vocab direction of kind of experimenting with things, there are some tools that you guys need to be aware of that you're going to be using nearly constantly in this class and any time that you use other graphic design products, um, other Adobe products, whatever. There's a couple of things that are pretty universal amongst all of this industry's tools and uh, kind of procedures. You have your regular selection tool. You know which tool you have selected because it has a little darker square around the outside edge. So if you look at the top of my Illustrator window, you can see that because I have my selection tool selected, it's got a little bit of a square underneath it. The selection tool is used for selecting things as a whole. It's used for selecting things generally, moving pictures around, moving an entire design around, moving an entire shape around once we get into shapes. Um, it's for moving big pieces. The direct selection tool, on the other hand, which is its cousin right next to it, that is for manipulating singular anchor points and singular specific parts of the designs that you're trying to edit. So these two are cousins. Most of the time, you're going to be using the regular selection tool, which the shortcut is V on your keyboard. If you press V like in a uh, vulture, V will get you the regular selection tool. And then if you press A like anchor you get the direct selection tool. Notice my cursor changes colors depending on what kind of tool I have enabled. I put it in the middle so it's a little bit easier to see. Be nice. Okay, I'm pressing V, I'm pressing A, V, A. The other tools you're gonna to be using really frequently are gonna be the shape tool. Anytime you see in Adobe Illustrator or in most of the Adobe products, anytime you see this little, um, this little corner at the bottom of a tool, 
If you click and hold on that tool, you will get extra options. So I clicked and hold my mouse on the rectangle tool, which gives me access to the rounded rectangle tool, ellipse tool, which makes ovals and circles, polygon tool, the star tool, and then the flare tool. For the purposes of today, we're gonna stick with the rectangle tool, which is M on your keyboard. If you press M, it turns it into this little crosshair that wherever you click and drag is gonna create that shape that you have assigned. So I want you guys to make a rectangle of your own here for a second because we're gonna talk about one more really, really crucial piece of Adobe Illustrator's kind of scene here, kind of presentation, so you guys are understanding it, is stroke and fill. So once you have a shape or a path, because path or shapes are mostly just completed paths, there are two pieces of color information that are gonna go into that path that are able for you, or ah, sorry, that you are allowed to customize and uh, edit for whatever you need. I'm going to press V on my keyboard to go back to the selection tool so I can move this around. Look at these little boxes right here. Okay, They're in the bottom corner. If yours looks a little bit more like this, if you have really tiny boxes in a single column of tools, there are two arrows at the top underneath the words no selection that if you click on that, they're going to expand it and make it a lot easier to see. I, pref I always work with the, uh, the two column layout because I can see my stroke and fill colors. Okay, so what are the stroke and the fill colors? The stroke is this box that you see in the front currently. It is the bottom box. This is the color of the outside edge of your shapes or the border or the fence around the whatever shape you're creating. If you double click on that box with the hole in the middle, you'll get the color picker. That's gonna allow you to pick the color, shocking, of the stroke, just the outside edge of a shape by editing whatever, um, whatever color you want it to be. You can choose a color uh, specifically by doing the thin column on the right here. So I like purple is my favorite color. So I'm gonna go kind of put it in the purple direction and then I can move my little circle inside of this bigger space around to mess with the relationship of white to black and purple, full purple saturation to no purple saturation, which is another way to make black if a color has no saturation. I can. I have lots of options, and you can see those options are going to get updated by this little top box right here. This is the previous set option. This is the new option that you're configuring. So I just mess around. Let's get a purple, kind of a lilac. That looks good. I'm going to click OK. But nothing happened to my actual rectangle. It's because I did not have the rectangle selected. When I click on the rectangle, if you hover over it, it'll say Path. Watch what happens to my stroke box, the one that's currently purple, when I click on it. It's going to turn back to black. It's because I was trying to edit something that I didn't have selected. Now that I have my rectangle selected, and you can see the anchor points and some of the, uh, these are called corner points. You can adjust them to make a rounded corners. If I double click on that again, and I change it to purple this time, it's kind of hard to see on the projector, but on the zoom room, you can see that the edge is going to turn. This is more of a fuchsia, but we'll go with it. Um, it's going to change the color of the edge there. But there's another box with the red slash through it. It's not doing anything for us currently. If you press X on your keyboard, just X by itself, that box with the slash in it is gonna come forward. And this is your fill color. This is the color that goes inside of whatever the stroke has on the outside. So the complement to purple, I think is like green. It's gonna be kind of a hideous color combo for a second. Um, but I'm gonna double click on this solid box with the red slash through it. Anytime you see the red slash, it means it's set to none. It means it's going to be see-through. So if I move this off to the edge here, you can see that it is just a shape with a see-through interior. But if I select it again and double click on the fill box, I get the same color picker that I was presented with before. And I'm going to pick some sort of hideous uh, green to go with my really bright fuchsia for contrast sake. And I'm going to click OK. And now I have this green rectangle with a pink edge that I can resize to however I want. I can read to rotate it to however I want. I can adjust the center points. I can make it bigger or thinner. I can do all types of adjustments because I'm not changing the literal relationship of the pixels. I'm just changing the relationship of the, um, of the expression. So all this making sense so far. These tools are doing things in this order, like keeping these things in mind, you're going to be doing this all the time in Adobe Illustrator. Yeah, Zahid, you had a question. Uh, what's the difference between using the uh, box with the red line for the color and the other one? So
so only time the only time you see the box with the red line that sets it to none so if i pull my rectangle over here to the off the white space here in order to change the green the fill color it has to be in the front so if your other one is in the front with the hole in the middle you just press x to bring it forward when i press this button right here and it turns white with the red slash that just means there's no color information on the fill of whatever shape I'm creating. This is a good question to keep in mind, actually, because anytime you're using tools like the brush or like the pen tool, when we get into the pen tool, it is related to the stroke color that you start with. So if I press B on my keyboard, currently I still have this fuchsia colored stroke set. Even though fill is forward, it's still gonna make fuchsia brush strokes on my artboard here. And I'm going to hold Control Z, 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 Z. Control Z is undo, something you do all the time. But if you undo too far, you can hold Control Shift Z. That's redo. It's going to bring back however many times you did something until it uh, until you last saved, at least. So I'm going to Control Z, 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 Z. Get rid of those real quick. If I want to change the color of a brush or a pen stroke, I have to double click on the stroke box. Change that to, let's do this kind of sea foam. All right, these are hideous colors, but they show up really, really well. They're not hideous, but we wouldn't use them together in a project. Um, because I changed the stroke color and not the fill color, it's going to act like you would expect a paintbrush to. Does anybody have any guesses what might happen if I try to paint with a stroke and a fill? Yeah, um, actually, I heard from you, Zahid. Uh, Tegan, right? Yeah. yeah. You can fill the whole canvas. Okay. Potentially. Dylan, you had something you were thinking too? That was any other guesses? Those are good guesses. But since they're paths, paths are different from polygons. Like in math, they need to be a closed shape, remember, or a closed sort of thing. If I were to take this brush, right, it's still set to the sea foam, and give it a fill. Let's give it a fill of like red. It's not going to fill the entire canvas. It's not going to actually do anything until I let go of my mouse. Oh, it didn't work that time. OK, let me try this again. Nope, it's not working. All right, so but what it should be doing is if I take my selection tool with V and I click on this path, and then I click this little, or if I double click to set a fill color, you can see something happening in there. It's going to take the path, the shortest path of least resistance from the starting anchor point to the ending anchor point and fill it in with whatever color you have set to the fill. So this looks kind of cool. It looks kind of like goopy, kind of 90s Nickelodeon style, like whatever. You could do something cool with this. However, if your start and end anchor points are not on the same level like they are here, watch what happens. Let me move just this anchor point. You can see it's going to start to cut across. And wherever it crosses a path, it's going to switch sides and create this, I mean, albeit kind of cool effect, but if you're not going for this, it means you're painting with some kind of fill. And anytime you paint with a fill, we do it here, right? There's no fill, but if I were to give this a fill, by double clicking on the fill color, we'll set it to a different one. It's gonna take the shortest path from the starting point to the ending point and fill it in with whatever color you set there. I'm just gonna hit backspace on both of these highlight all of these guys and delete that um, so we can start talking about your first project. Okay, we got about 10 minutes here. All right, does anybody have any questions so far about the kind of the basic breakdown of Illustrator? No? All right, let's talk about your first project. So if we go into Canvas, there is this line project link on the agenda for uh, this week. You can also find it in the modules by going to modules, and then it's right here underneath unit one line. This unit one line page has all of the videos that I'm going to be showing you that I learned how to do this, that I'm showing you guys in class. So if you want to work ahead for what this project is requiring, these are the videos that are going to show you how to do it. But I'm also going to show you in class, at least help you get started. We're going to start with this retro line design to begin with. Another really useful keystroke, we're going to hear, um, that was the one with like all of the lines overlapping and spinning over uh, one another. Yeah. So in order to do, let me close Photoshop since we're not using it. Let me out. Be rid Photoshop. Okay, fine. It's going to be difficult. 
Anyways, so in order to start creating that retro line effect, this is where I want you guys to follow along with me. We only have eight minutes left in this Zoom before I get kicked out. Press M on your keyboard to select the rectangle tool, but don't make a rectangle yet. We need to set the fill color of this rectangle to be black, but we need to set the stroke color to be none. We want no stroke information on this black rectangle. You want your black rectangle. Let's start by uh, setting the color before we do anything. Double click on the fill box. If your fill box is in the back, you can hit X to bring it forward. Double click on the fill box and either of the bottom corners, left or right, are gonna create true black. So click okay. That actually created white for some reason. In order to set our stroke to none, hit X on your keyboard and then click this button with the red slash through it. That is gonna set your stroke to none. We're gonna draw a tall, skinny black rectangle like this. That's a little too skinny. There we go. Something like this. And you can tell I have it selected because you can see the, uh, the squares around the outside edge. Now what we're gonna do is duplicate it by holding all, or first pressing V on your keyboard. See how it remains selected. You can still see the, uh, the anchor points in the corner. Hold Alt on your keyboard. And then when you hold Alt on your keyboard, the ALT, you notice when you hover with your mouse, there's like a little second kind of clone that appears on the cursor. Keep holding Alt with your thumb and click and drag this rectangle off from the side. It's gonna make a copy. We want these copies to be directly touching like this. You should be seeing the pink lines called smart guides that are helping you align the rectangles with one another. And then once you've done this duplication step, I will help you guys catch up. Don't worry, that's what I have more of the period dedicated to. Anytime you make what's called a transformation, that's a clone, that's a uh, translation like in math, that's a duplication, that's a mirror or reflection, whatever. If you hold the control key, CTRL, and you press D, every time you press D, it is gonna repeat whatever transformation you just did. And I want you guys to do that. We have two, let's do it eight times. So hold control and press D eight times. Just keep holding control. So control, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. That is gonna give us 10 separate tall, skinny black rectangles. What we're doing here is creating a brush. We're creating a pattern that we can apply to other paths later on in the future, but we need to do a little bit of configuring before that's quite ready to go. Everybody got control D so far? Okay, I'm gonna keep moving forward. Sick. Okay, so now your job is to, you see when you kind of hover over all of this, uh, it looks like an all black rectangle, but when you hover, it makes like a, like a card shuffling sound. Each one of the, or every other rectangle, we need to set to white in order to get of it that retro, like easy to see contrasting design. And to do that all at once, you can hold shift on your keyboard to select multiple items at once. So you're gonna go every other rectangle, starting with this second one. While holding shift, you just click, over over two, click, over over two, click, over over two, click, over over two, click. It's kind of hard to see, it's a little bit confusing, but I just need to finish up this real quick and then I can help you guys individually. Since we have multiple paths selected, and multiple of the, or multiple shapes selected, I mean. With these multiple shapes selected, we can change the color, the fill color on all of them because they're all selected and they all have the same starting point by double clicking on this color picker box for the fill and setting it to white. True white is in the corner. And you're gonna see, right? You can see the, re the rectangles that you have selected as you move around this color picker by putting your uh, sky up in the top left corner there and then you just need to click OK. We actually need one more black rectangle on the end. It has to start and end on a black rectangle in order for this to work. So to do that, you hold Alt on the first black rectangle, and you click and drag it over to the end of the last white rectangle. You want to make sure that they line up using those smart guides as best you can so that it starts and ends on a black rectangle. Now, in order to turn this into what's called a uh, brush pattern, we need to select all of these. You press V on your keyboard to get your selection tool. We're gonna make a general selection here. Don't worry, I will help you catch up. We still have lots of six period left. 
make a selection by just clicking and dragging over all of the rectangles. Okay. Then you're going to go up here to this brush cup button. You see the brush cup towards the top of the right hand side? This brush cup, when you click on it, mine's a little bit bigger than yours. Yours probably looks like this. If you click on the brush cup, it has this white square with a plus button in it that says new brush. Click on that new brush button. It's going to pop up with a menu that looks like this. You want to choose art brush. And when you choose art brush and click OK, it's going to pop up with another menu. All you need to do is choose the direction to be either up or down. It has to match the pattern of your pattern that we're creating here. So you have to do up or down. Left or right won't break, or it won't work for uh, the purposes of this assignment. I'm going to go up. You can go down. Doesn't matter. Yeah, Zahid. Um, so I can do brush button. Then you click the white plus button, and then you click art brush, and then you click OK. I'll help you in a second, because we only have so much Zoom room left. Once you click OK, there's going to be this zebra pattern that appears, if you've done it correctly, that you can apply to any shape like if I make this rectangle and click on the zebra pattern, it's going to take that those rectangles that we just did around the outside edge. It's not going to work perfectly. Let me zoom out a little bit. So you can see it's going to create something like this. OK, so my goal for today is to get you guys started with the art brush because the video that teaches you how to do this goes pretty fast. Um, as long as you have the art brush created, then we can start moving on once my Zoom room cools down we can move on to the next stage, which is actually laying them out in a retro design. Okay, sound good? I'll help you with your specific questions here in just a second. Let me process this Zoom room, and then that should be uploaded by Flex if you need to come back and check on it for whatever reason. Sound good? Okay, we're going off the air. I'll help you guys here in just a second. Give me two seconds and I will be, I'll be ready. Thank you guys for listening. I appreciate it very much. Which means we're live again real quick, and I can help you guys finish these up during Flex if you are in here uh, for my specific flex. So, I see six of us. Let's get a little bit more in there, please. Wait till you guys connect. Okay, I see 17 of us. I want, I'm sure you guys want to save your work. I imagine you don't want to do all this again. So if you want to get in the, uh, in the Zoom room, that would be awesome. Okay, so let me make sure my... Good deal. All right, to save your work, it's pretty simple. We're not quite ready to do what's called exporting, which is where you uh, it's where you take your um, your raw dough, so to speak, and you turn it into a fully fledged thing. We're not doing that yet. We're going to keep this dough because we still have some uh, some work to do on it. To save your file as a raw Illustrator file, you go to File in the top. It's the first uh, set of words towards the top of your page, and you go save as, because we haven't saved it yet. I mean, both would work, but we want to save as. Ignore this. You can even check this box that says don't show again, because we're always going to be saving on your computer. Do not save it to the Creative Cloud. I don't trust it. I've had too many students lose their work by saving it to the Creative Cloud. So what you do is click on save on your computer, this guy right here. You can check the box. And it's going to pop open your um, save window which you should have a graphic design folder in your OneDrive. If you go into your OneDrive right here, and then go into your graphic design, oops, that's Zoom recordings. Graphic design folder. You wanna title this for now, just call it Retro Line. You can put your initials on it, you can put your name on it, you can do whatever, but as long as it says Retro Line, uh, that's fine. Just keep in mind that when you submit the final version, it needs to be in a specific file name, which I'll make sure you guys know, um, or you guys have a reminder before you uh, before you submit it. You click Save. It's going to pop up with another uh, option here. You just got to click OK. You'll notice that the name has changed in the top tab of the page here, retroline.ai. 
and there's no longer an asterisk. If yours still shows an asterisk, it means you have not saved yet. Anytime you see an asterisk in the Adobe program, like if I move this, for example, you're going to see an asterisk appear after the AI. If I control Z, it goes back to normal. Control S. Let's see if I can like zoom in. Pay attention to right up here on retroline.ai. When I move it, something changes. There is now an asterisk. If I were to change or close this, it would be like, ah, you haven't, you haven't saved. Are you sure? And I'm not sure. So I'm going to control S, control Z, control S. And now I can close out safely because I know my raw file has saved. We're working on this retro line design one right here. I'm gonna show you how to vectorize tomorrow and how to wrap up the retro line design. The mountain logo and the artwork, or the mountain logo slash artwork is one that you're gonna to have to do on your own. So these two are practicing with Adobe Illustrator. This one is following a tutorial. Um, and all three of these, I'll show you how to combine them together uh, so that you can submit them for, uh, for credit and stuff. Okay. That is everything I have to show you today. I'm going to wrap up this Zoom room and start processing this video so that it can be uh, accessible and flex if you need to go over whatever we talked about today. Does anybody have any questions, generally speaking, for what we talked about today? Yeah. No, not homework. You'll have time on Thursday and Friday. There's no homework uh, officially in class. You can work on it at home if you want, but it's not okay. Any other questions? Be all good? All right, sweet. Thank you guys for listening. I do really appreciate when, uh, when you let me drone on these lecture days. Um, this is getting you started with a lot of these tools so that you have the creative freedom to approach future projects with more time and with more of your own, uh, your own eye, your own creativity. Um, and we'll go over the requirements and stuff for the projects tomorrow. And we still got a couple minutes left. Make sure you uh, shut down your PCs if you're not. Well, no, actually, we have Flex today. So just sign out if you're done using them for the day.